Welcome back to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, the podcast for real estate professionals dedicated to driving business using data. I'm Aaron Norris along with Sean O'Toole with Property Radar, and this is episode 34 featuring Ward Hannigan. Ward has one of the most interesting real estate backgrounds I've ever heard. He started as an orphan, eventually got into becoming an A&W franchisee holder in Mexico, then to stocks, commercial real estate law, uh, and then into dingbat rentals. Uh, you're going to be very interested to hear his journey into real estate and later on the show, how he finally focused on a very specific niche that nobody else seems to want. And he's got marketing lists that nobody else has because of the way that he approaches his dingback rentals and now accessory dwelling units. Won't want to miss this show. Well, Ward, I really appreciate you joining us today. And my first question is, what keeps you excited about investing in real estate? All the girls. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. You're in a different real estate business than I am. <laughs> no, it's just uh, it's just a quest. You know, you find out something that you like that um, and you've mastered it. Once you've mastered it, it comes uh, from a pain in a butt to a passion. And uh, if you live long enough, I prophesize that's what's going to happen to people. And so right now it's just a passion and I keep score you know, with uh, uh, proving over and over again to myself that uh, what I'm doing is valuable because I'm getting a lot of money to do it. And oh. as long as I can teach somebody, teaching element is is uh, very important to me and I've never, man, you know, that sort of thing. And well, I first came across you almost 20 years ago in 2002 when I was first starting in the foreclosure biz. Right. And I never took one of your classes because I had a very experienced uh, mentor that had done hundreds and hundreds of foreclosures. Um, but, you know, I always wanted to come to him with smart questions. So I spent a lot of time on your site, Foreclosure Forum, to at least try to find the answer first. You know, I think that's anybody who wants a mentor out there, like try to find the answer on your own first. You'll ingratiate yourself a lot more. And, uh, but yeah, your site, I, I think it was 2002, it was around and was yeah. had a lot of good information. Yeah, we, we endeavor to... Uh... Uh, use it uh, primarily uh, for the betterment of the people that came. And so I absolutely insist that we're not going to have any ads. I could care less if we made buku money with ads and all that crap and selling people's emails and all that. I'm not interested in it, okay? Because I make enough money in my, my, you know, my major foreclosure activity. And also, I love the freedom if I'm not, uh, that I'm not going to step on somebody's show, uh, toes, you know, because they're an advertiser and, and I think they, what they're advertising is overpriced or some other damn thing. Now your background is an economist um, in law. Did you practice either of those professionally? No. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? That's a lot of schooling. It was because of money. And uh, yeah, I, I was fascinated when I was in in junior college and also in uh, when I went to the university in cultural anthropology. I just loved it. I'm much more interested in, in society and, uh, and stuff like that. So, uh, but I got into, um, I was recruited on campus uh, by IBM. And so uh, I became, I was more interested in sales rather than technical end of it. So I went into office equipment sales instead of computers. No, but I like the I like the stuff you go out and meet people and talk to them and and uh, convince them uh, to uh, make things better for themselves by buying your service or either that or buying your product. So they didn't have a business major, so the next best thing was economics. Yeah. Well, so then, how did you fall into real estate? Fell into real estate because IBM. Um, I loved it the first year, it was all very new. Uh, second year, in fact, I did too well. I, uh, in one year, sort of unheard of, but in one in normally you don't get to the IBM's 100% club in the sales for sales, where you take a, a fantastic trip uh, anywhere in the United States and uh, sometimes foreign countries as a reward for being top in your division, your district, as far as sales are concerned. And you, you uh, nailed it. And I, I did it in spades. And it was funny because it embarrassed. Uh, There's only two guys out of the, the Riverside District that went to the 100% Club. And uh, and I went. 
and and, and I just uh, uh, it pissed all the other salesmen off. So I won a uh, 100% club, and when I came when we started the next year, they they uh, increased the quota. I could care less. Fine, you want me to climb another mountain? That's okay with me. I could. And that didn't bother me. But what really bothered me, and I hadn't thought about it before, was they cut my territory. And that's the way I felt. I felt like this is my territory. I had this very, very strong ownership feeling about my territory. And I'm the one that fertilized it. And I'm the one that organized. I'm the one that, you know, got people just primed to buy uh, with the next budget, just on and on. And I just could not get over it. I just could not get over it. And, uh, and so finally, in disgust, it, uh, I finally, uh, I just quit, shocked everybody. Uh, and uh, the manager really wanted to find out why I quit because he didn't want to be criticized, I don't think, by his supervisors. Is, Here's his hot shot and he quits. And so what the hell did you do to him? And uh, so anyways, um, I left IBM for that reason. Uh, and I... Uh, uh, in Hemet, there was a A&W root beer stand. And in the summer, Hemet's hotter than hell. And so I would go in there on the day, uh, I, uh, the day that I usually went to Hemet, whatever it was, a Wednesday or Thursday or something, and uh, drink a, uh, uh, an A&W root beer. And when I think about it now, uh, I could have one right now. But anyhow, uh, there's only one person in there besides me, and that's the guy that owns the joint. And... So I said, wow, how'd you get this place? And I'm making small talk, you know, and, and this is cool. And he had the, the district manager for A&W Root Beer right there where there's, there's a register. He says, well, here, here's this guy's card. He's the area manager. And if you want to talk about a franchise and uh, wow. And I thought, I thanked him for his card. And that night I thought, I looked at the card and I thought, A&W, hmm, I know enough people. They're going to raise some money and buy an an AMW franchise. And I wanted to put it in Tijuana because I noticed that that when I went down, say I married a Mexican gal and she has a zillion relatives in Mexico. And now that she's up to the United States, they want to come up at Christmas time. They want to come up on New Year's. They want to to come up on Valentine's Day or something. I'm always going down to the airport in Tijuana to pick up some friends or relatives and, uh, uh, and while I'm waiting for the plane to come, I'm standing around and uh, I'm waiting downtown, Revolution, and there's a Woolworths drugstore there. And they got a lunch counter. And no matter when you go in, the lunch counter is, dra- is jammed with tourists. And there's a line going out the front door. They would buy Woolworths hamburgers and stuff like that because they just didn't know about how they could trust eating Mexican food. And I go, wow, I could take advantage of that. This a and thing clicked in my mind. I thought, wow, a and everybody knows a and That's how I started. And I bought the A&W Root Beer franchise for Baja California Norte. And so what I did is I raised $90,000 uh, with some, some people that knew me. Uh, what year was this, Ford? That was in 65-ish. Wow. So it was a lot of money. It's not $90,000 today. No. Yeah. And I didn't have any money to put in. So I said, I'll work for nothing for free. No salary. I'll just get my, my portion of the, uh, of the profit. And I thought it would be profit a lot faster. You know, <laughs> I put a, I was completely wrong as to who my customer was. Absolutely. 180 degrees uh, upside down on that one. I thought it was going to be American tourists going down revolution to the uh, racetrack. And so I spent all this money uh, and we actually built on leased land, which is crazy. Uh, and it, the world's largest a w root beer stand at the time. See, so yeah, I got out of a and uh, and that's a story in itself as you can imagine. And then so uh, I stayed in San Diego. I fell in love with San Diego. I had an economics background, so I decided to become, uh, go to Shearson and Hammond, La Jolla and, and try uh, being a stockbroker. And again, I took off like crazy, even though I had an empty book of uh, what they call a book of customers. But I quickly found uh, out that uh, it's really a shady business. 
And so I saw there was a, uh, an ad in the paper, countrywide, countrywide funding. So Countrywide was a brand new outfit in 1969 in Los Angeles. And a year after that, they decided to open up an office in San Diego, the first expansion. And uh, so Mozilla interviewed me. Okay. And, oh, personally. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, gave me the job. There was two people hired in San Diego. Again, how big, how big was country? I mean, this is or it's just for the viewers. We're talking about countrywide financial, which was okay. kind of the epicenter of the foreclosure crisis. Mozilla was, you Mitchell, know, Mozilla was a, uh, a conniver, right? Uh, yeah, it, it was it, like it, one of the biggest names in the whole foreclosure thing. And we're talking a huge company that was yeah. still sold to Bank of America. And how big were they when you interviewed? Oh, it was just one dinky office, you know, I mean. Uh, he would use other companies' forms and copy of them and uh, just put Countrywide's name on it. And that was the form that we would use, you know, to, uh, to uh, interview people for mortgages and stuff like that. I remember one time it had a question on it and it says uh, uh, something like, uh, uh, are you interested in, uh, uh, I'm going to shorten it up, uh, like mortgage term insurance. You know, that's what it was really about. But anyhow. And nobody knew anything about it. My office, and I called up LA, and nobody knew anything about it up in LA. I mean, this is on Countrywide's form, and you don't know what it is, you know? <laughs> so that gave me a clue that it originally was somebody else's form. <laughs> so anyways, they gave a spiff if you checked yes. And because uh, uh, there was a premium that uh, was charged, you know, as they added it to every monthly payment for mortgage term insurance. We did the interview with husband and wife in their home when I was qualifying, taking the application for a loan. And I'd say, okay, Tom, when you die, not if, but when you die, uh, do you want June here to be saddled with uh, uh, the continuing payments on this mortgage? Or would you like to have the house uh, fully paid off at the time you, you die? And he, can't an easy say, <laughs> yeah, he couldn't say in front of his wife, no, let us struggle with a mortgage payment. And so it was 100% yes, yes, yes. And so it got to Angelo's attention that this Yahoo in San Diego, Ward Hannigan, is, uh, is, is used up all the SNH green stamps. And uh, so he calls me up. And, uh, Saturday was our sales meeting down here. It was, it was up in LA. And he wanted me to come up Saturday and and tell the sales force up and say, what, what was my approach on getting people to agree to paying a little extra? And, and I tried to tell Angela over the phone. I said, look, it's, it doesn't, uh, coming out of my territory on Saturday to go up there, it doesn't, it, it isn't that, it's so simple. Let me tell you how I do it. Right over the phone, Angela. I mean, you could do it. It's just, it's not, not a, he won't listen to it. He said, hey, I told you, I want you up here. I want you at our sales meeting. It starts at 9.30 on Saturday. And that's the end of this conversation. Bam. So I went up there and I purposely walked in, said, how did the guys I had about six or eight or 10 salespeople or something like that? Mr. Jones, all right, when you die, do you want Millie over here to be saddled with uh, the mortgage, having to deal with mortgage payments when now you're gone and that income's gone? Or but just for the price of a, and IBM taught me, sell the difference and so I said, just for the price of a pack of cigarettes, all right, once a week, okay, uh, she could, uh, they would be completely paid off if something tragic happened to you, pal. Uh, okay, that's it. See you guys later. <laughs> I took off. <laughs> that was, well, anyways, so. Lord, you have led such a full life. And uh, let's pull forward to uh, Dingbats. And, uh, and also what you're doing today, because, you know, you are, after all these years, you're still after it, still making it happen, still closing deals. I understand you got some stuff going with ADUs and let's, okay. let's pull forward to today and, and give folks some, uh, okay. some stuff they can use in the market right now. You know, here's one man's song and yeah. uh, maybe they can sing it too. I'm convinced that we now uh, have progressed medically in both devices and medicines and stuff like that, uh, treatments that the average person, if they don't play the no-no games, you know, no booze, no drugs, no, uh, I, don't, I don't, 
alcohol, uh, all this nonsense, and uh, you're not uh, a real daredevil, you probably can have the expectancy of living approximately to 100. And so the problem is that you're going to be replaced, I guarantee it, you're going to be replaced at about 50 to 60 years of age, no matter how good you're at or what you're doing. And so now the problem is that since you didn't think it was important enough to create something while you had an active income so that it would give you a passive income in the second half of your life, the second half of your life is going to be a long period of time. That's going to be uh, 40 to 50 years. And so you got to get start taking something that you make out of the first half of your life, all right, and given an opportunity to come to fruition at the beginning of your second half so that it's going to carry you through. And uh, so that turned out to, for me, that turned out to invest in something that I don't have to babysit, invest in something that I don't have to keep spinning. Uh, so it doesn't require my active presence. And so that's why I say it's a passive uh, income type thing. Uh, that occurred to me when I was 40, 45. And I was making so much money in foreclosures that I didn't think that I need, didn't need to, to, to do anything else but that because I never made 40, 50, 60, $80,000 in a crack. And I just, whoa, you know? What year was that that you were going so crazy with foreclosures? I got started in foreclosures in 82. Okay, I worked for um, uh, Countrywide for about two or three years. Then I decided, you know, I can sell rings around these guys. Mostly guys were selling real estate in those days, were retired. The guys really didn't t intend to really understand anything about mortgages and mortgage rates. And uh, let's say they sold, uh, they, they, they sold the house and now they got to find a lender trying to palsy wowsy the salespeople so that uh, they would steer the buyer to this mortgage rep or that mortgage rep or something else. And I remember Weyerhaeuser was, had such crappy rates because Countrywide is trying to very quickly get market share. They're the new boy on the block and they want to elbow their way into the trough. And so uh, they had really low, much lower interest rates. So I remember one day just couldn't believe it. This guy, T.O.'s his he uh, uh, mortgage to like Weyerhaeuser. And I, I knew Weyerhaeuser's uh, 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 the fees and everything else. And they just stunk compared to Countrywide. I said, why did you do that to your clients? And he picks up a pack of Wrigley's gum and on it has got uh, a thing that, <laughs> that they gave him. That's what he got for steering the goddamn deal to where I couldn't believe it. It just, oh, I said, oh you'd go and screw your, uh, the, the listing that, that you got, your, your owner, all right, for a pack of gum, I walked out of the damn office and said, hey, I'm, I can do this standing on one leg. Yeah, the mortgage side is really much harder in a lot of ways on all of that stuff you have to do. So you had this great combo. You got sales from IBM, right? You got entrepreneurship from A&W. Now you've got, you know, good real estate knowledge from Countrywide and doing a bunch of mortgages. So you put all that together. You're in the real estate business. You're doing a lot of foreclosures. Jump to dingbats. Okay, so let's jump to ding dingbats. So one of the things you do when you start acquiring property, when you're selling it, is uh, uh, you might do a, a 1031 exchange. And so I did a couple of those. And uh, one time, uh, this guy, he wanted us to take uh, from his side, not only his apartment house, but this stinking little one bedroom, one bath, old piece of junk, you know, and he dug his heels in. He said, no, I don't want this. And I, but I, and, and I got it and I'll sell, I'll, I'll agree to your trade with uh, your property and my apartment house and stuff like that. But you got to take this thing too. Basically, I took that as part of my share of the deal. So I took this trade and then about a year later, two years later, I completely forgot about it. And I, and I TO'd it to Eric, said, hey, do something with this, you know, sell it, do something. And I, I don't know why, but about a year to two years later, I asked, I said, Eric, what do we, did we ever sell that one bedroom, one bath piece of crap that we had to take? And he said, no, 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 we didn't sell it that. We still have it. And I go, what? We still got it. 
yeah, we can't sell it. <laughs> Nobody wants to buy it. It's too old and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Who's going to brag about buying a one bedroom, a 60 year old one bedroom, one bath house? I said, damn, you still got it. Yeah. So, well, how many times do you have to rent it out to somebody? So, I don't know, is the lady that's lived there uh, when we bought it is still there? And I go, wow, that was not my experience. And when I'm selling, when I was in the, uh, I got into the apartment business, by the way, okay, as an agent. So I became an agent uh, and when I uh, left the, the countrywide, yeah. Yeah, countrywide. And so I worked for 10 years then uh, buying and selling apartment houses as an agent. And uh, so I had gone to law school, uh, but uh, I, uh, nobody wanted to hire me because I went to a no-name school. So I wasn't going to go into practice myself because I knew that I didn't really know. I only knew half of law, and that is the book part. I didn't have the experience of, of uh, knowing my way around the court, how to frame an argument in front of a jury, you know, all that kind of stuff. More doing apartments than practicing law. Oh, yeah. So I, I said, oh, I'll, I'll do it someday when I you know, get older. Uh, selling real estate, lots of times you have to be creative with financing to put the deal together. And so uh, I uh, learned uh, uh, from a guy in uh, Phoenix, showed me how to do wraparound deeds of trust. I didn't even know what the hell he was talking about. And they're or all inclusives. And so yeah. I mastered that. And then I found out it doesn't pay to be the only person in the, your whole area that knows this because no one else wants to, to uh, work a deal with you because they don't understand it. And so how can they tell their seller, so let's cooperate with this and we we'll carry back an all-inclusive deed of trust and blah, blah, blah. So I had to start a class under the, um, the aegis of, the, of a title company. So I told, convinced the title company that, hey, uh, let me teach this class in your boardroom on weekends. And uh, I have an attorney buddy I met in my law school. He was the he was the real estate attorney, but he got his license in the Navy. He would come to me and breaks and this and that and ask me what was the crux of this case that we're talking about? What was the element in this and that? And so after a while, we came pals. And uh, so I told him, I said, hey, I need, an, I need to, to convince a title company to let me teach a class. It's actually, I want to tell him you're teaching the class. I'll show you what, what you need. And... Uh, what equipment you need and stuff like that. Taught, uh, put this class on, it says, if it was the attorney's class. And uh, that's how I, I started with my, I found out that it takes two to tango. You just cannot be the only genius in town. You gotta be able to do business with other people and you got to, and if they're not there, eh, you gotta train somebody so that you, you can, you know, dance. I that convinced. started your career in real estate education then, because you've had a long career now doing that and teaching people the oh, business. Yeah. And that was the first one. Yeah, that's probably right. And I started fa- I started buying uh, commissions uh, from other salespeople that uh, you know were living on a dime, and and so we would be splitting commissions because we tell somebody, hey, um, let's do a wraparound deed of trust, so we don't have to pay off that mortgage. And we're going to do it in such a way that it'll never be discovered that you're getting around to doing sale clause. And I had to explain all that kind of stuff. And so, I, just, I want to explain for our viewers really quickly, a wraparound deed of trust. So if I, as the owner, I have a, a good mortgage at a good rate, and you want to buy the house for me, right? But maybe you can't qualify or you can't get as good a rate. What we do is we put a wrap around my existing mortgage that says you're going to make payments basically to me, and I'm going to make payments on that mortgage and you get to now live in the house. So you get to become the new owner. You're going to give me a mortgage, but I'm going to keep my mortgage. And so it wraps around. And that's that's the all-inclusive. It includes the underlying mortgage or wraparound mortgage. And then you get sophisticated and you make sure it's collected by a neutral third party, a no collection service here in San Diego. It's called uh, Toro something, Toro no collection or something. So it wouldn't come undone because sometimes the guy that you sold to originally, he now turns around and sells it to somebody else and he doesn't explain it quite good enough and starts to come apart. Yeah. Anyways, one of these, my, uh, my all-inclusive mortgages, it was sold, the property, the apartment house was sold uh, more than once or twice after I sold it. And uh, so uh, all of a sudden now 
the guy that the original owner who he wrapped his mortgage calls me up and says, Ward, he said, you convinced me to carry back this all-inclusive deed of trust. And now uh, there's no payments on it. What the hell am I supposed to do? And I said, well, you start a foreclosure. And he said, well, how do I do that? We started getting into the details, you know, that motivated me. I'm going to law school at the time. That motivated me to go to law library and got every book written on foreclosures in Cal California foreclosures. Not interested in other states, California foreclosures. I started buying uh, wraparound mortgages because nobody wanted to buy a wraparound. All right. People in town would like to buy a mortgage for some income in this and that. But oh, no, no, they want an ordinary mortgage. They did nothing new. And so I knew that I could drive a, a better bargain by willing to buy. If I'm the only willing buyer, all right, I don't have to be as much as if everybody knew what that was. And so I had mortgages coming out of my ears. And, uh, and what I didn't like about mortgages, and I still don't to this day, is that uh, uh, that the person in control is the payer. Because if the interest is is up here and he can find a new loan down here, all right, uh, then he's logically gonna to wanna to refi. And so I get paid off earlier than expected. I found out later there's a lot of wisdom in not trying to uh, get the, the greatest part of a deal. You gotta have leave something in for the other side or they have no incentive to stay in the deal. Damn it. You know? And that took learning. On that apartment deal, you ended up with the dingbat right? Um, yeah. uh, this, the one bedroom, one bath the tenant had stayed in there for a while. Right. And which was a surprise to you because in apartments, you saw a lot of turnover. You, so you were surprised this person turnover. stayed in. You get turned a lot of turnover because I had actually, I, I really had ex experience with one bedrooms. I had, I got convinced I got to buy uh, a, a six unit apartment building and they were all one bedroom, one baths. It was like a friggin' motel. Because, you know, people are just coming and landing and, and, and finding, uh, uh, getting their whereabouts uh, of, of the town and, and this and that. And, and so they didn't want to make any commitment until they found the, the best place to buy a house and they understood the town and where the values were, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they stayed a year and, and they would leave. And uh, so uh, I had 100% turnover and I was a great manager. So my bias was, I don't want one bedroom, one bath. I mean, you couldn't find a guy that was more polarized and saying, one bedroom, one bath, stick it. In spite of that, I was so curious because my experience with the apartment houses, they, they just leave their lousy tennis on, on. And here's this little lady, she's doing nothing uh, 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 terrible to the property. She keeps it clean and neat. She pays promptly on time. She's very sweet and on and on. And I, yeah, the, the, the difference between this and this. And it just got me very, very curious. And so, so I found out that she's on this thing called Section 8. And I found out she's really not paying us the rent. Section 8 is paying us directly to our checking account. She pays a tiny part, 10 to 20% of the rent out of her own pocket. And the government, the federal government, through Section 8, pays their difference. And wow. And so it's very hard to find landlords that agree to Section 8 uh, situation. And so she just absolutely was petrified that I was going to sell the property and she'd have to move or uh, I was. Uh, so she never wanted to, to do anything wrong, noise wise, uh, taking care of the property, just on and on and on. And uh, wow. So. I started super thinking, reliable tenants going to stay there forever. Completely yeah. different situation. No, I, yeah, and I didn't realize it's going to be forever. I tried, you know. In fact, actually, I said, "Oh well, if that works, maybe I'll do a duplex." And so, <sighs> duplex didn't work. I couldn't figure out why for a while. Now I know. And uh, anything else, it, it has to be, must absolutely have to be a single standalone, one bedroom, one bath, one story house. Okay, That's otherwise. The you're going to jeopardize uh, uh, the amount of time they stay. And right now, they're staying 24 to 26 years. It's that's, you know, that's how long your tenants are staying tenants of your properties. Absolutely. And so can you imagine a cash flow coming in 
at, you know, 180, 200, uh, 240 months without interruption, not one interruption. All right. And, and it, these, these it, properties it, are the, are selling cheap because nobody wants them. Nobody wants them. And I love that. I love what nobody wants. Man, you're talking to the right guy. And I just have this big smirk on my face, you know, all the time. And right now, as a consequence, I have 20. I have, and almost all of them have been there 20, 25 years. And uh, uh, but the dingbat, the brand new one, the ADU that I built on the back of the house that I already own, uh, boy, is she a gem. Now, why? Because she's young. She's 51 years old, okay? is a, a, an odd quirk or missing cog or something. Uh, uh, doesn't allow her to hold a regular job. But other than that, she can live alone. She takes care of her property. She can cook. She eats. She does that. She drives a car. Blah, 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 blah. So anyways, uh, she pays me $1,383 a month, okay, for the, that's the payment standard uh, that Section 8 goes to on a one bedroom. If it's a two bedroom, it's more. If it's three bedroom, and they go up to six bedrooms. So it's a zero bedroom if it's a loft or a, a studio. There you go. Uh, so zero to about six. Most time, five. And, uh, but I'm now very, if I got a deal, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would, oh, okay, sure. I'll, I'll buy a two bedroom and they'll buy a two bedroom house. And so they only stayed about half the time. And so most people would give their eyeballs for somebody that would stay, you know, 15 years, but I don't know, Jesus, I could have had 30 you know, or, or 25 at least, let's sell it. <laughs> and so I got around to purging my collection and selling out every anything that did not uh, match the profile. I mean, I even have uh, duplexes with one bedroom in the front and one bedroom in the back. Absolutely, it doesn't work as good. They, they, it's at about uh, turnover about once every 12 years. They have a common, what the real problem is, a common wall, okay? People, spelled especially elderly, treasure more than anybody, right? Peace and quiet. And so if you have a common wall, with a neighbor, ah, as far as they're concerned, it's driving them nuts. Or they might have an angel, all right? But then that angel moves out and all of a sudden now comes a turd as, as the, the guy on the other side of that wall. And oh man, you know, and then she wants to move. So I get two vacancies. He's moving because he's an idiot and she moves because she's all riled up that the guy is, uh, he's, he has the audacity to be playing his TV after nine o'clock at night, you know? stuff like that. And these houses so are, are old. You, how, sound travels through them like, you know, a tissue box. So you've got all these one bedrooms and some of them have enough land, I guess, to add ADUs. So now you're adding one bedroom ADUs and that's not upsetting the apple cart because it's no, no common wall. And no, most of the time, I wish that was it, but most of the time they're, they're not on over the, a large enough lot to allow a uh, building another ADU. Okay. Got it. it just happened to be that particular, uh, neighborhood called Shelltown in San Diego that was designed from the get-go in 1940. I was born in 1940, so 80 years ago, uh, then zoned so that you could put a house in the front facing the street and a house in the back facing an alleyway. Wow. Yeah. And so now in that 80 years, it's now little by little, it's been completely built out. Okay. And so, uh, but there's enough left over that, uh, if I live long enough, what I'm going to do is go through those neighborhoods. Here's my new plan is to, is to uh, go to a guy who never took advantage of building anything on the back end of the property. And I say, listen, I want to do a deal with you. It's not going to cost you a penny out of your pocket. Not now, not ever. Okay. I'm going to build a house that you're going to see because I have the availability to show it to you on the inside. The tenant is happy to get uh, 25 to 50 bucks from me to open it up and let us walk inside. But you're gonna admit that it's a really very, very, very nice ADU, okay? It's only 492 square feet. I had it specially uh, designed by a, uh, an architect who took my son's ideas and my ideas, put them together, and we got the ideal, the most fantastic ideal unit for a, 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 an elder citizen. All right. It's got 36 inch wide doors everywhere. It's got not one stair in the whole place. It's super insulated. Uh, so they're not wasting their energy, uh, you know, or it gets overheated or too cold and all this kind of stuff. 
I mean, I even put in for some future uh, tenant uh, to plug in her electric car. So I got an electric outlet to handle uh, charging electric cars. So 90% of my tenants don't have enough money to have a car, you know? And da, na, na, na. so uh, we're running out of time. Oh, um, so new for me. You've got this amazing ADU and uh, you're partnering now with folks that own these special lots in, in Shell Town and putting the ADU in the back. And yeah, well, uh, I use all my own money because I got tons of it. So I'm using yeah. my money and I build everything. So not a penny out of the pocket. And then for the next 25 years, I manage it. Okay. If anything goes wrong, I pay for it. Never a penny out of his pocket, but I get all the rent for it. Okay. What if so they I, decide I, they want to sell? I, what happens I've then? I've made all my money back plus another several hundred thousand dollars. And um. I can bet on it. Keep going. Unfortunately, I have a hard stop right now. So I'm going to go and say goodbye, Ward. Awesome to uh, to have you on and uh, learn so much from you over the years. And thank you for all that you've given to so many in the, the real estate business. And, and I'll let you guys continue. Because I, I want to back up for a second and explain how brilliant it is what you just did. So it's a list that nobody else is going to have. So you're talking about a very specific neighborhood where it was designed with an alley where it's almost like you can come in and build this ADU and put a wall down the center of the lot. And for all intents and purposes, it's two separate units completely, two right. detached separate units, right? Right, on one piece of ground. And the design wise, that's perfect. And you already know the ADUs that work. Um, is there a garage on these or is it just? No, most, of the, most section eights don't have enough money to afford a car. And so it's not a negative if you have no parking. All right, Fantastic. you're gonna be walking everywhere. The breeze, I had uh, some space on the back, all right, to put a driveway and I elongated it so that you could have tandem parking. So you put two spaces and you approach it, of course, from the alley. Mm -hmm. right? And, uh, but, uh, and it just a fluke, uh, this gal that I put in, uh, she needed two off street parking places because her daughter, who's ready to leave and probably has already gone on because she's, she only had um, another uh, year in school and she's going to move to somewhere in LA. Uh, but she got extra money from uh, the state because uh, she had a daughter. Okay. And that says so they're going to pay more for dependent. And, uh, but um, so most of the time, uh, if I can do it while I'm building the house, uh, yeah, why not put the, uh, the parking uh, uh, driveway? I didn't. Ha I don't have. Uh, there's nothing over it. In other words, just a. It's just a. Uh, a driveway in the back, and uh, so then I noticed. Well, okay. So here's a. There's an alleyway and an alley. You know, the difference between an alleyway and an alley is an alley is wider, and an alley allows some parking in the back, mm -hmm. and it has lighting. Okay, this is an alleyway, so it's, it's not wide enough to allow parking, and it has no lighting. Well, think of it yourself as a 60 to 65 year old gal. Is she going to want to walk at night coming home? Uh, I mean, after she goes to the supermarket that's three blocks away and carry groceries in a dark alley and there's no lights and on and on. So I said, now nah, uh, that's going to maybe agitate or bo bother her enough to where uh, she might want to move faster than 25 years. So what I did was I, I, I um, put a sidewalk on the inside of my property line going from my unit all the way up the property line on, a, on the east side to the sidewalk in the front mm. and put okay. a gate on there and put the mailbox there, okay? Ah. And then I, in, this, uh, in this gate that I built halfway, uh, you know, the, the gate that split the lot, I put a gate, uh, I, I'm, excuse me, a fence and... Uh, so that, and that's uh, operated uh, to where the people in the front can't come in her yard and she can't go really in their yard. Uh, she, uh, because the fence is kind of like a quarter and it uh, uh, gives some security and privacy to both people. So uh, yeah, that's uh, how it worked. So she can decide whether to park in the front or the back then as well. Yeah, but the problem with the front, the street is when you have when you, when you have a single lot, but you have two houses on almost every single lot, 
you've doubled the population and neighborhood. And so now there's almost always two families or more living in each house. And so the available mm-hmm. parking is premium. <laughs> premium. In fact, I got a thing going on in my mind that if she ever moves, and I get a gal that doesn't have a um, uh, car. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm going to, I'll tell you what, sweetheart, why don't I rent out the parking space to someone in the neighborhood? All right. And I'll split the rent with you 50, 50. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now, when you're approaching people that you don't own the property, what happens if they decide to sell? Um, is well, I put on a property. See, I can't lease the land because if you lease more than three years, and I want to go 25 years, uh, then the assessor considers it the equivalent of a sale and wants to reassess the property. So I know he's not going to want to do something which causes a reassessment of his property, increasing his taxes, and uh, he not getting some money for that. Okay. So uh, I figured out, okay, there are forgiveness loans out there for cities, for whatever reason, they want to get cops to move into tough neighborhoods and this and that. They'll provide uh, a junior note, and which is usually the down payment. And if he stays there 10 years or five years or whatever the time period is, they'll forgive the note. You won't have to pay it. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's not an installment note. All right? It's a straight note, no payments until the end. And so that induces that that uh, a doctor or that whatever uh, to stay in that neighborhood uh, and, uh, and, and normalize the neighborhood, right? With cops and stuff like that. So I've got that, I've got a forgiveness note. So if he, if for some reason, whatever, who cares, uh, they wanna sell the property and this and that, uh, and they wanna pay off my loan. But my loan is gonna be for the exact amount that it cost me to build it. Okay. okay. And, uh, and then it's going to have an interest rate that's going to be modest. Okay. And, uh, but it's not going to be due and payable uh, if I am allowed to stay there in place for 25 years and collecting the rent. That is very interesting. Now, I, you and I br- briefly talked about this. There's two different ways to approach a stick build. Well, for the stick build structure of the 452, uh, 92 square feet, there might be a reassessment by the county, um, a little bit of property taxes. So the owner might have to pay property tax unless it's a structure like a tiny home. So if. Yeah. The tiny homes um, are too impermanent for me. And I think would be too impermanent for uh, my tenant. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to get rich in life, and I really believe in this, find out what your customer wants and then what? Deliver it. <laughs> yeah, give it to them. Okay. And so yeah, I didn't know who my customer was. See, because I thought a tenant was a tenant was a tenant that I never distinguished between, uh, uh, you know, senior as a tenant, as someone on section eight as a tenant, or, you know, that kind of thing. And I, all of a sudden, I had to sit down and figure out who am I really want as a customer. So I just uh, saying, you know, birds of feather do what? Lock together. Lock together. And so where do seniors go? Where do older people go? Oh, senior rec center. Wow. So you're not going to find any 18 to, uh, you know, 49 year olds uh, <laughs> going to a senior rec center and learning how to play bocce ball or something. So good idea. And then I learned that they have senior nutrition centers. Ah, that is a gem. So uh, I, I don't have to advertise anywhere. I do once in a while in section eight, uh, a nationwide um, uh, website. It's called gosection8.com. You go there and drill down to the state you're interested, to the county, the city, the blah, 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 and you'll find a bulletin board set aside for that local area for landlords and tenants to announce themselves, okay? And, uh, but I, the way I like is with the way I, uh, I, I, uh, I think I invented, and that is, uh, these nutrition centers, there's many nutrition centers in a, uh, a metropolis as there are branch libraries mm. because it's by neighborhood. So San Diego is an example. We have 18 um, a senior nutrition centers and we have 15 branch libraries in San Diego. Wow. Okay. So if you ever wonder where that's going to be, where it is in your neighborhood, just find out where the the, the branch library is and you find 
you could probably going to be uh, uh, a uh, nutrition center in that little in that community, that neighborhood. And so um, they usually start at eleven o'clock in the morning, and they go to about twelve thirty, uh, right at noon. They don't give breakfast, and most of them don't give supper. I've heard some of them do, but anyways, most of them it's just a lunch, a nice nutritious. Uh, uh, lunch that's kind of like, um, I call it orphanage food because I grew up in an orphanage where you have casseroles and you have, you know, uh, a biscuit. Right, the basics. You have, you have overcooked lima beans and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So, but it's real cheap, $3 uh, if you're a senior. Uh, of course, being government, they can't not let you... Uh, I'd be a, a, a customer uh, and you might have a guest, but if somebody's younger than 62, then they pay uh, double. So it's like $6 or maybe $7 rather than a three for the senior. So okay. do, you, do you go and sponsor uh, or how, do you, how are you connecting there? Well, what I do is I go on Lombardi time. So if the thing starts at 11 o'clock, I'm there at 1045, 15 minutes early to make sure I'm at the head of the queue or the line that is starting to will start right about on 11. And I wanna be at the head of the line because I'm gonna have about 20 or 30 flyers, a picture of my vacancy and uh, some of the pertinent stuff about it and direction of how to get there. And a, a, an offer that, hey, uh, if you want us to pick you up and uh, take and show it to you and take you back home, fine. Because some of them are so poor, they can't, they don't wanna spend money for the or Uber or uh, a cab. And so I'm there. So when someone comes up behind me, it's just very sociable and logical. I would turn around and say, oh, hi, my name's Ward. What's yours? And you say, Aaron. And I go, oh, Aaron, you look a little bit too prosperous to uh, uh, be uh, uh, enrolled in Section 8, but I bet you you get a lot of friends and accomplices, not accomplices, but acquaintances and uh, uh maybe even relatives are on section eight and uh, not as lucky as you. Uh, but what I want to do is give you a flyer in case any of those people all of a sudden need uh, to find another place to land because they're being displaced because somebody bought the dinky little house and now they got to find somewhere else to live. And according to section eight rules, if they don't use their entitlement uh, after 90 days, then section eight feels free to give it to somebody else. I did so not know that. 90 days to, to find someplace. And so they're kind of panicky. So you could be a great help to them, Aaron, <laughs> if you have my flyer, because it's got my name and number, and I got a lot of units in this area, and just give it to them. And, I, and maybe at that time, I might have a vacancy. So why don't you take one? So he does. Well, you and I know he probably is not Section 8, but right. doesn't want to admit it to a stranger. So I'm saying, ah, you look too prosperous. <laughs> I like and, then I just, and then I go, Aaron, you want to get ahead of me? Oh yeah, sure. So nobody can get upset because I let you, they're ahead of me. Yeah. And so then I, and I inchworm, I call it, I inchworm myself down the line. So by the time uh, uh, the line starts moving, I'm at least halfway through it, handing out my flyer because mm -hmm. they don't want anybody handing anything out there. Okay. And so I'm hidden because I'm part of the line. I think it's cool. <laughs> Well, it's a list that nobody else has. What a creative way to target a market that is not on TikTok or probably social media all that much. It's it's just a very unique way to approach the business. I've always loved the ding bat rental. Yeah. Um, I last I told Sean before we got on the air that I'm like I think at one point his average stay was like 17 years. Well, I guess we haven't I hadn't asked that in <laughs> a long time. So to have that long of a stay is insane. How well, people how are living a lot longer now, even the oldest. Well, how are they as tenants as far as calling you and needing things? Well, never, never. Really? Their their attitude is that they're effusive, absolutely effusive, and I need I use this by the way. Uh, uh, in their gratitude, right? And so you might ask me, okay, Ward, let's say using your technique of uh, getting in line at the Senior Nutrition Center and holding out flyers, you said 20, what if three of the people in line or four, you know, uh, call you up and they want to take a look at it and, and they want an application and this and that. Now, my question is, well, how do you decide amongst these three people or four people, which one to take? And my answer is, the one who 
is uh, very, very uh, uh, obvious, uh, uh, exhibiting gratitude. They'll thank me for giving them an application. They'll thank me for, uh, uh, you know, letting me uh, let them see the, the unit. They thank, and, if, and, and, and it never stops, but I found out, is when they're paying me every month. I have one lady, and I have not just one lady, but I have a couple of ladies, but just one one. She, for 30 some years, right? She sent me a, the rent in a thank you card every month. <laughs> Every single month, That's sweet. all right, and, and and she's blessing me in Spanish, you know, uh, that such a wonderful landlord, and you know, blah blah blah, and so she stayed. She stayed until she had to move out. People say, "How long am I going to be staying here?" And I said, "Until you have to go out feet first. You think that would irritate them? Oh, they love hearing that because <laughs> they really, yeah. I remember <laughs> one time she's at this gal. She was so funny. She says, really, I've been I've been upset by or surprised by landlords that tell me that, but it doesn't turn out to be the truth. And I said, you got a pin? And she said, well, yes, I need a pin, I said. So she went and got me a pin. And I said, okay, I'm going to prick my finger with this pin, and I'm going to write in blood that I'm, you can stay as long as you want. No, 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 you don't have to do that. <laughs> Well, I just, I love when we get a chance to talk about niches on the show and realizing people can bring, you know, their passion or find a really hyper local niche that nobody else wants or owns. I mean, this is definitely very niche. And my, ex my experience, Sean, is you don't have to be concerned about blabbing about it to everybody around you or in the, nobody, but nobody, but nobody does it. I've, I have a class and I teach people how to do this. You think that, you know, after you paid me $900, you know, you'd go out and use it and do it. And I give you the manual, all the forms. I tell you, call me anytime you, you get stuck. This doesn't end here. You know, it ends when you die because I don't talk to dead people. But, you know, and so anyhow, it, I, I, I have trained probably, I don't know, let's say two dozen people. Not one of them has yet done it. Hmm. Not Why one of them. Why do you think that is? I think what it is is some a day, some a day I'm going to do this, some a day, some a day, some a day, and they just put it off and put it off and put it off. They're actually a little bit embarrassed that when I see them, that oh, I know you're going to ask me if I got started yet, but no. And I had one gal that didn't bother taking my class. She heard about it because I was giving a talk out in, in Palm Desert, and um, uh, we needed a, uh, about another. 30 minutes uh, to fill the time. And so besides talking about the trust, the organizer of the club says, Hey, war, why don't you tell them about that crazy thing you got? What do you call it? Ding something or other ding bath. Right. So I did. She was in the audience, her jaw dropped. <laughs> and she, whoa. And so then she, she, she uh, uh, had a million and one questions and she was getting so excited and on and on. And, so I said, hey, you call my number anytime you want and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so she never took the class. She took the class over the phone, you know, asking me all the questions and blah, blah, blah. And uh, now that's was, uh, five years ago. She's got 10. Mm. 10. Oh. 10. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And she was, she called me up. Her name is Julie. She said, this is Julie. She says, you know, I don't think I ever thanked you because I'm doing my taxes and I now notice that I am making about $4,000 a month free and clear, all right, off of my rentals. I got mortgage payments and this and that, but net, net, net. And I did that. In fact, I now see that I can retire and have a very, very solid income. And you're right. Nobody moves. Nobody's creating any aggravations on and on. And uh, <laughs> so go figure. She, she, she just did it by dint of constant calling me and this and that. And, uh, and, and I had fun uh, and, and uh, you know, showing her. She uses, she buys different size properties, two bedrooms. Uh, okay with her. 
hypothesize that she's she's going to have a much higher vacancy rate than I do, and so it's it's going to be working out to be probably uh, she has a vacancy probably every five years, and she rents to younger people. Her heart goes out to uh, uh, wounded warriors type, mm. and uh, so I said, well, you're going to find out that even though they're wounded, they got a mindset of a 28 year old. And so a wanderlust and, and not being stuck in one spot all their life. And they want to go out and see the world and they're going to do it in a wheelchair or, or with a, uh, you know, an artificial leg or something. And so she does have, but her eyes are open. She does have a much higher vacancy than I would tolerate. Okay. And it's a program called VASH veterans is V it's a, it's a combination of VA and a section eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, but she now knows she's forewarned and first for me and then, then through experience that um, it's not uh, as perfect as what I have. Well, 25 years, most people would be very happy with half that uh, turn rate. So we, we have run out of time. We've gone way over um, and we, we didn't get, we'll have to have you back another time to talk about title. My brother went to your course. I know a lot of people who've gone through your course. I am going to be going through your title course as soon as we finally get uh, to meet. I want to go through it in person. Um, you are one of the most creative and well-loved people in the business. I think they should name ADUs after you actually. So <laughs> ding about ADUs. I like it. But you know what? If people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? The best way actually is call our office number at 619-283-5444, or we still have our website up for the foreclosure game, though I think it's over. And that is the uh, www.foreclosureforum.com. There is a archive of a ton of articles I've written, and some of it uh, can be germane uh, today, uh, some not. I have handy little things like how to roach proof your property. Absolutely guaranteed roach proof. Do it to one time. You don't have to do it again hmm. and uh, stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, or call, give us a call. I love phone calls. Um, in fact, I'll do anything to generate more phone calls because that's what keeps me on my toes and keeps me sharp. It's people asking me these questions and it forces me to review that subject matter before it's gone stale. You know? And if you go to the San Diego Creative Investors Association live, Ward is typically in the back at a table and more than willing to answer question, which I've always appreciated. So Ward, I will make sure to definitely post all that information on the website. And thanks. Thank you for listening to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. You can find show notes and links to some of the resources mentioned in the show at datadrivenrealestate.com. Click that, join the community, and you'll be forwarded to the Property Radar community where you can ask questions about the current show and even see upcoming guests and ask questions there. We'd love to engage with you in the community, so check it out. Please don't forget to like, favorite, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform where you're listening to the show. It helps us out a great deal. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.